The cyberpunk aesthetic and genre has steadily increased in popularity over the last couple of years. If you look at popular media and the number of properties over time, there seem to be a lot more pieces of media that can be considered cyberpunk these days than ever before. Now there's a whole host of reasons why that might be. One obviously stems from the nostalgia cycle having finally hit the 80s in the last decade, so a lot of the neon retro aesthetic has seeped into popular culture in general. But I personally attribute the current popularity of cyberpunk as a genre to the fact that we seemingly inhabit the if not outright dystopic times usually depicted in these stories, at least the prelude to one of these dystopias. So it seems to be on a lot of people's minds. But that's a story for another day. In terms of video games, probably one of the most immediate points of reference for cyberpunk is Deus Ex. Not only visually, but also in terms of gameplay. It's one of the most prominent games in the immersive sim category, which are RPGs that are characterized by giving players a lot of freedom in how they want to go about solving the various problems put in front of them, either through combat, stealth, hacking or dialogue. And these games tend to take a realistic and freeform approach to problem solving that favors creativity over rote execution. Now I don't want to assert that because of that there's this unspoken expectation for a cyberpunk game to necessarily also feature this type of game design. But Dex very much seems like an attempt at making a 2D Deus Ex game. Even the title suggests that they took the name Deus Ex and removed a couple of letters, similar to how they removed the spatial dimension. In fact, for a game in a genre that is typically identified by stories that often tackle disruption from a status quo that gets reinforced by rigid adherence to certain norms and traditions like the ever-present problem of hypercapitalism, many cyberpunk stories tend to adhere to genre convention fairly closely, to the point where much of the genre can seem a little bit interchangeable. It's always set in a moody city where the haves and have-nots are stratified into the glistening high society or the slums, the city invariably has some kind of gang problem, illegal trade is rampant, substance abuse is commonplace, hackers hang around every street corner, etc. And there are only so many times you can tell the same story again and again within the same setting before it gets boring if you don't add anything meaningful to it. But yeah, Dex is a 2D side-scrolling RPG set in a cyberpunk world. And by jolly does it want to make sure you know where it draws its inspiration inspiration from. The aforementioned Deus Ex connection is already there, even beyond the basic idea of making a cyberpunk RPG, but a bunch of stuff is also very reminiscent of Count Zero. Now if you have no idea what or who a Count Zero is, I don't blame you. If you have a passing familiarity with the cyberpunk genre, the term Neuromancer will probably ring a few bells, since it's one of the earliest and most prominent works in the genre. Well, did you know that Neuromancer wasn't just a single book? Yeah, it was actually a part of a series. And Count Zero is the second part in that trilogy of novels, usually referred to as the Sprawl trilogy, since they're only loosely connected plot-wise and more recognizably connected by being set in the same fictional world. Anyway, Count Zero, as well as to a lesser extent its sequel Mona Lisa Overdrive, feature a character who has the ability to jack into cyberspace without what's commonly referred to as a deck. As I said, genre convention is often kept even to the detriment of the setting when you have a future where laptops and cell phones don't exist. And this ability is kind of a big deal in these stories. Much of the first novel is about gaining physical access to certain places, and the novel reads more like a futuristic heist thriller than anything else, so being able to do that from everywhere naturally puts that character into the crosshairs of a lot of sinister actors. And Dex's eponymous main character also has this ability. And that's not all it nicks from Neuromancer if the term freeside means anything to you. Anyway, said ability is further highlighted when it becomes the catalyst for the entire story, so forgive me if I'm not immediately thrilled by being presented with something that one of the progenitors of the genre used as a central plot point very early early in the genre's life. Now I've mentioned earlier that the game takes obvious influences from immersive sims with this idea of having multiple avenues being open to you to solving your problems. And while that's certainly true to a certain extent, it's also fairly evident that the developers weren't successful all the way through. For one, the game keeps pretending that stealth is a thing, but it's more an exercise in frustration than anything else. Since there's no way to creep around corners in 2D, the game has to make do with random bits of cover that Dex can hide behind. Once she does, the game turns into this boring rigmarole of watching enemies slowly creep along their set patrol while waiting for them to turn around so you can cuddle them to death, all the while hoping that some other hitherto unseen enemy doesn't shuffle into view and get alerted to your impromptu cuddle session. There is an augmentation that you can get that allows you 
you to use a consumable that turns you invisible for a brief period, but I honestly think that's mostly just a waste of money and time. There's no tangible benefit from sneaking past enemies, you don't gain any experience, unlike dealing with them either through takedowns or direct combat. The game does sometimes remember that stealth can also mean evading enemies through alternate hidden routes, but those are far and few between. Yeah, I get it, the man-sized air ducts that littered the later Deus Ex games weren't realistic in the slightest, but they at least offered something different from the eternal waiting game and rewards players who actively went out looking for them. Not to mention that later on the damn air ducts still make an appearance in decks anyway. But in this game, more often than not, a stealthy approach is just not that much fun, because it doesn't really lead anywhere off the beaten path that you couldn't just access in some other way. Now since this is a cyberpunk game, hacking obviously has to show up in some form as well. There are two flavors of hacking in decks. One is this sort of arcadey maze looking thing where you have to fly around twin stick shooter style and shoot at a bunch of what I think are supposed to be intrusion countermeasure electronics, or ICE for short, that guard a variety of data points that you have to reach. These are usually accessed through computer terminals, so so much for Dex's ability to connect to cyberspace from anywhere. The second variety of hacking happens directly in the world itself. Since Dex's plot MacGuffin is her ability to jack into the Matrix from wherever she wants, and yes, that is a deliberate reference to Neo's ability to do the same at the end of that trilogy, she can also do that during missions to hack into cameras, turrets and enemies to disable or temporarily stun them in the latter case. Now while this sounds great in theory as an expansion to the player's arsenal of options, unfortunately this is undone by the fact that these sequences are excruciating to pull off. In order to hack something, you have to stay within a certain radius of whatever it is you're trying to hack, while being constantly harassed by these same countermeasures. Aiming at and shooting down all the enemies and their projectiles is an exercise in frustration, because it takes ages to get anywhere. It's so drawn out and boring, and it offers so little incentive that it's honestly more worthwhile to just do everything with physical combat. I would have loved to make use of systems like these while infiltrating enemy compounds, but it's just such a clumsy implementation that it's just not as fun as simply using your guns to shoot shoot down these cameras and turrets, and that's saying something. So once you've exhausted those previous two methods of dealing with enemies, you end up with a combat system that offers either melee attacks and blocks that leave you wide open to armed enemies taking pot shots at you, or the ability to wield a gun while standing perfectly still while trying to aim and letting melee enemies pummel you for a few free hits. Honestly, neither of these offensive abilities are all that engaging. If you're in a 1 vs 1 punch up, there's no tactical finesse to any of the fights. You just have to block everything until you see an opening to land a couple of hits, while occasionally dodging out of the way whenever the enemies telegraph any of their unblockable attacks. Shooting enemies from afar is equally annoying, since you can't aim straight up or down, and alerted enemies on different levels of elevation have a habit of congregating exactly above or below you. And at all other times, it's just a slow chipping away at their health. It never feels like you're in a position to fluidly dispatch of your enemies. Everyone tanks a bunch of damage, and I hope the footage manages to convey just how much of a stilted and static affair these interactions really Really are. And I'm not asking for enemies to be pushovers here, I don't mind the test of skill. But this isn't it. It's just repetitive and dragged out, there's no dynamism to any of the combat gameplay. And whenever you're in a situation with more than two enemies, it just becomes an unbearable clusterfuck since there's no way to deal with multiple enemies simultaneously, so you end up getting pummeled left and right. The game might proclaim an adherence to the 90s era visual aesthetic, but I would have liked it if it at least managed to arrive in the current millennium in terms of gameplay. Now given that this is an RPG, much of it isn't just following the critical path. In fact, most of it isn't. If you take a look at the list of quests available, you'll notice that the main quest is vastly overshadowed by all the random stuff you get to do for other characters. And the game tells you pretty much directly to your face that you should stop following the main path and instead go out and talk to people to do some side quests the moment the tutorializing stops. To the game's credit, it tries to paint an evocative picture through these quests by letting you interact with a host of different characters and their predicaments. While a lot of the side quests are fairly boilerplate stuff, there are a few that were a bit more interesting. Probably my favorite, at least in terms of concept, is the one where you're trying to help a woman suffering from cancer. You can either convince her son Timmy to steal a donor organ or offer to pay for it yourself. If you go with the first option, Timmy ends up stealing the organ from the doctor you've been seeing all through the game for your augmentations. If you tell the doctor who it was and later return to him, he'll offer you a new set of replacement organs that boost your health bar, with the implication being that those organs came from Timmy. On the other hand, if you offer to pay for the replacement organ, you'll get rewarded with a seemingly worthless trinket. The twist here is that you can later on actually flip it for more than what you've spent on a replacement organ if you sell it to an antiques collector. I like how the outcomes of this quest 
quests aren't immediately obvious. It tries to present you with a moral question befitting of the setting, without clearly telling you what'll happen if you choose either. You could risk losing 500 credits, a not insignificant amount of money in this game, just to help some random NPC you'll never need to talk to again. Or you could just suggest an immoral action that wouldn't massively stand out against the backdrop of a cyberpunk dystopia. What lets this quest down, however, is that there's not a lot of interactivity to it. It's mostly just a few linear dialogue scenes and a bit of traveling back and forth, something which the generous fast traveling mechanic actually makes a breeze. While it thematically carries a lot of weight, in terms of what you're given to do with the quest, it seems more like random filler and as such doesn't feel entirely congruent. Not to mention that, while I commend the idea of implementing morality into quests like these, there's not much in terms of consequences outside of the immediate rewards you get out of them. The world doesn't react to you for convincing a boy seeking help for his dying mother to commit a crime. It has no wider ramifications. And this fact that many of these side quests are rather insular and unrelated to each other or the wider storytelling is a shame. These quests introduce you to a variety of gangs, corrupt corporations, shady dealings, etc. But those elements never come together to create a greater whole. It just seems like a lot of these quests were designed to invoke typical cyberpunk cliches and present them as playable stories that don't interact with any of the other stories in any meaningful way. They also have no great impact on the main narrative, since none of the players of those side quests make any appearances in the main quest itself. Said main quest is also severely underdeveloped. Don't worry, I'm not going to spoil anything here, but let's just say that if you're somewhat acquainted with cyberpunk stories, you'll know that stuff doesn't just stay street level forever. So at some point there are a bunch of critical and very spoilery revelations in the plot that mean that your entire struggle is much more far-reaching than it initially seemed. The game does try to go for a nuanced ending by giving you a choice to either do what your cohorts from the start intended or to do a complete 180 and end up doing what the ostensible villain of the story had in mind for you. I'm not sure why the writers even went there. It's clear from the ending you get for siding with the villain that this wasn't the intended outcome since that ending basically tells you fuck all about about the consequences. Why even bothering implementing a potential heel turn towards the end when you're not doing something interesting with it? Never mind that these types of twists that try to recontextualize things often just fall flat because they come completely out of left field and as such always hamper the effectiveness of choices you've made earlier while under completely flawed assumptions about the state of the world the game takes place in. If you want to do something like this, you must inform your players about this stuff beforehand. You can't for example tell your players they're about to tear down a corrupt shadowy cabal and then come out at the end and explain that the Illuminati were acting with humanity's interests in mind and that all the shitty stuff that happens somehow has a purpose that's supposed to bring about betterment for all for some reason. That's just manipulative storytelling. To completely shift gears at the end of this review, let's talk a bit about the technical aspects of Dex. I generally like the visual aesthetic of the game. The pixel art look of the game is certainly timeless, and the large but still visually pixelated sprites are well designed and expressive looking. But expressive looking doesn't mean that they're also expressive when animated. There's a distinct lack of frames and flair that comes from these animations and makes them look rather stilted. A punch, for example, may have three frames of animation, but no real sense of pacing. I really advise the animators and sprite designers behind this game to look up the basics of animation, specifically this idea of anticipation and follow through. And as good as the sprites and the world look, this doesn't really carry over to the rest of the visuals. The cutscenes are composed of these digitally painted stills that often seem to draw the characters completely differently to how they look in game. Never mind how Dex transforms from this in the Steam menu to this in the cutscenes. The UI is mostly functional and intuitive, with the exception of the quick selection wheel, but it's kinda ugly to look at and somewhat frustrating to navigate. Probably the most useful feature, the map, which you can use to fast travel between districts of the city, is the penultimate screen in the options, so you always have to manually scroll all the way to the right to get to it. And while the inclusion of character portraits for dialogue scenes is nice, they're all fairly ugly to look at with this overblown lighting. Especially the blue rim lighting that makes it seem like they're a streamer with an overly bright blue LED light strip to the side of their face. And speaking of the dialogue, while it's mostly well written and manages to imbue the people in this game with character, the voice acting is a mixed bag at best. Some, like Decker, because there's always a character called Decker in cyberpunk stories, are mostly pretty good, though his voice sounds like the character was raised on a diet of gravel for breakfast. But others carry an affect that not only makes them tiresome to listen to, they also draw out their dialogue endlessly with dramatic pauses and a slower cadence. I'm someone who tends to read along with the subtitles, and it's 
just frustrating having to indulge some pawns who can't hurry the fuck up with their attempt at building character through speech mannerisms. Sad voice work is also very unevenly mixed. Some characters almost get drowned out by the soundtrack at times. There doesn't seem to be any ducking present in the game to make sure that the music quiets down whenever characters are speaking. In the end, I don't think I can recommend Dex. The lacking storyline, which is mostly derivative of other works in the genre, the shallow gameplay and especially the annoying hacking weren't really all that fun and there's an overall lack of polish to the entire affair.